Hey guys and girls, how are you today? So nice here to see you. Thank you very much for joining. I appreciate it and a special shout out to any new subscribers I've had recently. I've seen a few come in. Welcome. Nice to see you. This is uh, my second uh, series of uh, video in relation to this zoom lens. Now I've got the 24 to 70 today, which I'll be introducing to you. So that's very exciting news. Uh, but right now I'm just going to review and go over the 70 to 200 with the teleconverter and the experiences I've had with that recently. So as you see here, I have the Nikon Z7 Mark II in front of me. That's the camera body right now. That's a re very recent acquisition. I'm shooting with the Z7 Mark I right now with a 50mm prime. So here we have the uh, 70 to 200. Now I'll be holding it close to my body and face because I've got a shallow depth of field here on the camera and it may not come in focus otherwise. So just uh, bear with me if you see me constantly pick things up and put them to my chest. It's really for your benefit that you can see what's going on. So here we have the 70 to 200 2.8 zoom. Here we have the converter attached to the back of it. As you can see, it's quite a small, tidy unit. I've related it very similar to the FTZ adapter in size. It's just about twice as heavy because there's glass elements inside. But it's very well balanced, being that this part goes very close to the body. The balance seesaw effect, if you like, is very central and it feels very comfortable to use. You barely know it's on. And if you can put up with the weight of the 70 to 200, you can certainly put up with the weight of the teleconverter there as well. It's not an issue. So anyway, here it is connected and I've been using that extensively now, I would say, for the last uh, week. Uh, very, very, really smashing it with photos. Uh, in fact, uh, just Tuesday, I uh, went out to a animal theme park and must have taken uh, several thousand photos. So when I say I've tested this out, I'm not saying I went into the backyard, took a dozen photos and I'm assessing an opinion on that. I mean, I've taken dozens of thousands of photos just in the last couple of weeks. And believe me, when I say it does this or it does that, it's because I I, I know I've tested it thoroughly. So uh, anyway, what we're going to do is we're going to briefly summarize this. I will give you many test uh, photos will come up. I uh, might even have to break this into a two-part video because I have so many photos to show you and talk you through and illustrate uh, what happened and when and how and how my feelings were with using this lens and teleconverter combination. But I can summarize it very briefly just for now to say that I'm very impressed. It's working extremely well and I do love using it. Uh, it's extremely versatile to have that. Just to be able to just think about this, all right? For something that is so quick to put on and off, to be able to very, very quickly make this safe and put it away in your camera bag. And as you can see, it doesn't doesn't take up any space. It's certainly a lot. This is a little 35 millimeter prime, and as you can see, it's about a third of that size and volume. So it doesn't take up any any much uh, space in your camera bag or weight thereof. So it's a very convenient unit to use. Uh, I always like to get into the habit of putting the caps on because if you forget, you can easily damage the uh, lens. But at the moment, the uh, this converter. It is a two-time converter that I'm showing you now. Uh, you know it's the recent one because it has the warning label on it to say which way around to put it into the lens. So that is you always put that extended piece into the lens. Which is also why, of course, you can only use it with the 70 to 200. It's the only lens that's compatible with at the moment because it's the only lens with sufficient depth to stick that uh, insertion in. So it doesn't matter if you have an FTZ adapter or any F mount lenses, or none of them are gonna be compatible. It's only compatible with the 70 to 200, which suits me fine because that's the one I've got. But besides that, it's the lens that would be most appropriate for it anyway. If you've got a very long teleconverted, uh, for, sorry, a very long uh, telephoto lens, then you don't need the converter. Uh, if you've got a very short prime, then you don't need the converter. Just use the different prime that's available. So if you've got a 50, you're not going to put a converter on it. You're going to just use the 85. Makes sense, right? So that's logical. Now, uh, when using this lens, for example, the 70 to 200, which I'm going to discuss initially, while it's fresh on my mind, I just connect these two together to illustrate. When using this for doing portraits, for example, which uh, without the converter is exactly what I'll be using it for. On the focal range uh, arrangement here, you'll see it goes from obviously 70 to 200. Uh, I'm finding that when I'm doing portraits, I'm doing most of the portraits between 135 millimeter to about 150 to 200, 200 being ideal. You see 200 at f2.8 gives you a magnificent shallow depth of field. It looks gorgeous, I don't mind telling you. So it's a, it's a beautiful image. You get a great, 
bokeh, you get a nice soft background, but because of the angle of view, because it's 200 mils, it's a very tight angle of view. And what that means is you don't get a lot of stuff in the background. And so if you have got less in the background, because it's not wide angle, it's not scoping everything around your subject, because it's tight, that means that there's less information for the lens to have to blur out and make into bokeh. And the less information behind you, the softer and creamier that bokeh is. So really, at 200 mils at f2.8, it's every bit the equal of an image of the 85 at 1.8. Might be surprising to think, sure, how can it be the same as a 1.8? It's because of the focal length, because of the extension. The longer you get, it's going from, say, 50 mil to 85 mil. Now at 200 mil, it's really tied in. There's less around there for it to have to blur out. So even at 2.8, that is a really soft, milky background. So that's just something to consider. And the reason I'm bringing that up uh, right now from the start is because there's a new lens come out called the 50 1.2. Now I have absolutely no doubt this is a beautiful lens. It's well engineered, I'm sure. I uh, hear only good reports about it as far as its build quality and image quality. But as I already have a 50 1.8, which I'm using to film right now, uh, that's more than adequate for my use for a 50 millimeter. I don't need 1.2 for video. I think that's gonna be too shallow. I'm gonna struggle for autofocus. Uh, so I think, you know, to me the 51.8 is perfect, it's nice and light, and does an excellent job, as you're seeing right now, what an excellent job it does. So I, I don't need the 51.2, and I can't see myself ever purchasing it. Maybe when a 50, uh, sorry, the 85mm 1.2 comes out, that could be exciting for portraiture, have a bit of a different option, different look to things, but at the moment the 85mm I have at 1.8 is more than adequate and does a great job. I do find though that the whole shallow depth of field thing is, is well I'm not going to say it's overrated because I use it and I love a nice creamy bokeh background too. But the uh, trade-off of the creamy bokeh background is often that you're losing half your face out of focus. So when someone's straight on like this, that's fine. I'm looking directionally at the camera as the subject would and uh, you're using a very shallow depth of field, whatever focal length or aperture that is, uh, you'll definitely, if you're focusing on the eyes, you're going to get both eyes sharp. But when they're turning slightly to the side and looking to the camera, you've now got a different angle of view on the face. And you might be able to focus on that eye, but you can't focus on both eyes at the same time. Certainly not at 1.8 or definitely not at 1.2. So what you're going to have is a situation where one eye is in focus, then the nose starts to get blurry, and the other eye is completely out of focus, and the ear, forget about it, that's starting to get bokeh now. So that's not a good look. It's a, an interesting novel look, but it's not really a justifying the uh, the model or subject at their best. It's what it's doing is really showing off your shallow depth of field and bokeh, but not really helping the model look good. So you've got to weigh in that balance. This is why I actually turn to this uh, longer lens for doing uh, headshots, because I think you actually get a better look, and it also holds you back from going too shallow and then actually messing the Im image up where you only got half of their face in focus. So if I know I'm gonna need to do something super shallow and it's all about the bokeh because that's what the subject wants, I'm gonna use one of my prime lenses and get in tighter, getting closer to them, and I'll have that and I'll try and manipulate them so that their face is directly at the camera or just only slightly off center. But if you're gonna do photos where their head is gonna be turned and you're doing some sort of creative posing, uh, definitely stop even the primes down to 2.8 or f4 because otherwise you're gonna regret it in how half the face is out of focus, and I personally don't like that look. If you like it, okay, that's cool. It, to each his own, everybody knows what they like to see, but for me, I'm just encouraging people to avoid uh, take, getting half the head out of focus. I think the background needs to be out of focus, but the head should be in focus. So some tips around that, by the way, are this. What you can do is you can take multiple photos, like photo stacking. So you've got the, like when you're doing humans, of course, unlike doing birds or animals, it'll scatter and just move at women, you can't control them. Uh, a human, you can ask to control themselves. You can say, please, just sit there and uh, be motionless for a few seconds. And we are talking five or 10 seconds. I'm not talking about making them sit there like a zombie for half an hour. We're only talking about 20 seconds or something at the most. While they're posing and they're still and the lighting's all perfect and right, why not take multiple photos? Take one at the widest f-stop. If that's 1.2 or 1.4, 1.8, whatever it happens to be that's the biggest aperture, take that photo. Then take a second photo with it of the nose, second photo of the distant eye and so on. Take maybe four photos across the face and you can photo stack them in Photoshop and that way you'll get your beautiful creamy bokeh background because that'll still be equal to the 1.2 or 4 or 1.8 but the face now will be fully in focus. So that's the first option.
The second option is to take two photos. One photo of the closest eye, if their face is tilted. Uh, one photo there, but at f2.8 or f4. So you'll get the whole face in focus. Then take a second photo at 1.4 or 1.2 or 1.8, whatever your widest aperture is. And that means that you get the nice bokeh background, but you've got the face sharp. Merge those two. So you've got options out there to achieve the goal. But as I say, the half the uh, face in and out of focus thing, where possible, I'd encourage people to avoid that because uh, I don't think it's a great look and it's certainly not complementing the model. It's just really showing off your camera gear or photo skills. It's all about you then. It's not really about justifying the subject. And I think that's just, quite frankly, unkind and a little bit selfish. So anyway, that's what I'm looking with with the uh, 70 to 200. That's my portrait go-to lens now. And if I want a special effect, I'll use any one of these primes as well to complement it perhaps. Uh, carrying around the converter is great because sometimes you just see an opportunity. You might see a nice wildlife scene or animal or creature. You want to get in tight and get a nice photo of that. You can pull out the converter and in a matter of seconds, then you've got this big telephoto with you, equivalent of one anyway. So that's very nice. So that's really summarizing what I've done in the past. I will share a lot of photos that I've taken with the uh, 70 to 200 with the teleconverter, which equals it up to 400 mils. And uh, you'll be, I think, pleasantly surprised with how good that looks and how it works. Uh, this say, I took thousands of photos at a wildlife sanctuary recently and a few visits out, and it's been a magnificent performer. Two thumbs up, really good. Second thing I want to talk to you now about, and that's actually the main reason of this video, is this new acquisition. So what I have here, I'll just bring it up to my chest so you can see it and read it. It's the uh, 24 to 70 f2.8 zoom. This is a brand new uh, lens. Uh, what I say brand new lens, been out for about six months, maybe a year, but brand new for me. So I've just got it this week. Now uh, with this, I didn't buy it brand new at a retail shop, although I did buy the 70 to 200 that way and most of the other lenses but uh, this particular one I was fortunate enough to find on eBay so what happened here is a gentleman uh, formerly a Sony shooter oh sorry formerly a Nikon shooter now turned to Sony he's bought himself the uh, Sony a7s mark 3 which is a magnificent camera for video and he does mostly video and product photography so for him that was the perfect thing to get and I commend him I say that's great I have no issues with anybody using any camera brand or gear. They're just tools to a trade. You know, the thing is, you've got to make a choice. I made a choice with Nikon. I'm happy with that choice. But I could have easily just as well chosen Canon or Sony or Fuji or any other brand, and that it wouldn't be an issue. Because it's not about the brand, it's about the results. So getting back to this lens here, uh, I was... Uh, always interested in having it because of its versatility it's it's uh, every bit as good as the prime lenses but it's not better than them it's just as good the only downside is that at f2.8 as nice as that is it's nowhere near as shallow as a 1.8 or what will be 1.2s coming out but uh, either way it's more than adequate for what its purpose is and its purpose is really an all-rounder it's a general purpose all-rounder lens like a street photography lens if you like a going to holidays lens a landscaping lens you know, for beautiful pictures of scenery, it's very nice for that. It's not ultra wide, like uh, for example, a 14 to 24 or a 14 to 30. They're ultra wide lenses when you get under 20 mil. Quite frankly, I never take photos like that because I don't like the look of 14 mils. I find anything between 14 to 20 mils to be overly distorted. All the, all the angles are coming out like this all the time and lines and to me that just, it messes with my brain. I, my brain can't take that very well. Even now on this, using a 50 mil lens, you'll see there's some slight variation in the uh, straight lines behind me. Uh, that's, that's just a matter of with the camera angle slightly you know, off center and so on. But I'm not worried about that. It's very modest and soft. But uh, see here, I have a 20 millimeter prime lens and this uh, 20 mil uh, 1.8s from Nikon is a brilliant lens and performs extremely well. I really like it. I think it, uh, it's a great performer and I use it a lot on my Ronin S for video. So because it's relatively lightweight considering in comparison to say the uh, 14 to uh, 24 2.8, that one weighs probably almost twice what this one does. So it's nice and light and also the filter size. I've got a um, a variable density filter here. It's a rotatable circular 
one and that's uh, brilliant for convenience when you're filming you need it a little bit brighter you need it a little bit darker it's just a flick of a switch it's really quick and easy so i find this package with the 82 mil filter that's readily available and versatile on other lenses in fact it's the same filter i use on this it's an 82 mil on the, the 70 to 200 here it's a 77 but i have a stepping ring on it to make it 82 so if i want to carry all these lenses around they're all using the 82 mil filter so i can swap and change as i need i'm only bringing one filter with me so that's a uh, very convenient that's what I like to do anyway. Now you might say, what does that mean he doesn't have any filters? <laughs> doesn't have any filters. Uh, mate, I got a bad box here of filters. I have every filter you could imagine in every type and size. Everything from 52 millimeters all the way up to the 82 millimeters. And I've got the polarizers, I've got the neutral densities, I've got the you know circular density filters. I've got everything available there if I need it, because sometimes you do. But when I'm traveling around or on the fly, I don't want to bring that box of stuff with me. So if I could just bring, say, three lenses and uh, one filter, well, that's magnificent. That covers everything. And I just want you to think about this. Uh, even just these two lenses alone. Now, with our little friend here, this covers from 24 to 400 millimeters of focal length in just these two items here in a converter. So you can see how you could easily pack these into a camera bag there's a little package there. Throw in, you know, a few spare batteries as well. And that's quite a modest little camera bag, isn't it? So one filter works on everything. It's a modest little set. That's very convenient to go anywhere with. You can go traveling, holidays, whatever you please. And it's a modest kit in volume and size to take around. So I'm encouraging people that, uh, you know, that's actually a pretty good option. Optically, the primes are great, but I don't want to have to carry 10 lenses with me everywhere I go. I'll take a prime with me when I know specifically I'm going to need it, and I have to use that focal length at that particular aperture to get the result I want. Other than that, I'll just bring the zoom now. So uh, the optical quality of these new zooms is so good now, I'm so impressed with them, that I have no qualms about using the zooms for the photography or video work. Where in the past, I didn't love them as much. I'll be honest with you, the older zooms are left a lot to be desired but these new ones are so optically brilliant uh, I don't even think twice as an option I encourage people 100% to go ahead and use them and you won't be disappointed in your image quality at all you're not stepping back saying oh I'm using a zoom therefore it's lesser quality no it's actually every bit as good as the primes it just doesn't have that uh, same f-stop the same aperture that's all and that's the primary use where these primes come in handy it's for the convenience of the fact that they're lighter weight and you get a bit brighter an image so uh, with this uh, 24 to 70, uh, how have I found it? Well, I'll tell you what, I've taken thousands of photos with it in only the week I've had it, and I can tell you it's absolutely awesome. It's really, really good and sharp quality. I uh, just recently changed the uh, desktop uh, picture profile on my computer, and I'm using a photo I took as a, in a landscape mode, and it was uh, beautiful. Absolutely gorgeous photos. It's taking razor sharp and clean. Focusing is great. Just everything about it is good. It feels nice to use. Now it is a zoom and it has that feature where the uh, lens barrel extends. Of course, the 7200 does not do that. Uh, it's all internal. Same with the 14 to 24. It's all internal movement. I would actually be honest with you. I would prefer this did the same, but I'm sure there's some engineering uh, issues where they can't do it or it's just too big and difficult if they did. Probably end up about the same size as this if they tried to do that. So I can see why they've uh, tried to make it a bit more compact. It makes sense for the type of lens it is. If you've got something that is like a, a street shooting lens, you want it portable and light and convenient. You don't want a monster. Even if it is maybe uh, structurally superior, it'll be too big and awkward to bring around. So, but the feel here, this is the, what's interesting about it. The feel of this motion here is not the same feel as the 24 to 70 F4. These are two completely different animals. This here feels weighty, it feels metallic, it feels professional. When you have it on the camera, uh, look, there's no way you're embarrassed about having it on. It feels professional, looks great, and performs perfectly. And of course, with the 2.8 uh, in opposition to the F4, it gives you a bit more scope and, and you know shallow depth of field and uh, light taking in capability. So that's always a bonus and nice to have as well. So apart from the fact that uh, the show off factor of it being the pro level lens and uh, feeling good and strong, uh, I do like its performance and its mechanical ability. It feels very good to use. In no way is it tinny or anything like that. It's, it's a brilliant piece of equipment. So I love it. Uh, I probably never will get the 
a 14 to 24 2.8 not because it's a bad lens it's uh, from all i hear it's a magnificent lens but you see this already has the 24 involved in it doesn't it so i don't need that end of it so then i really only need the 20 to 14 part i have a 20 mil prime lens here so as you can see i'm not going to need to have the 20 mil element of that 14 to 24 because i've already got 20 mil covered in my bag so that means i only really need the 14 to 20 mark or say something around 16 mils but see i don't use those i don't like the look of the ultra wides i don't like that distortion i understand certain landscape photographers and astrophotographers want that and uh, i understand why they want it but that is not me and the sort of work I do. I like all my lines to be very graphical and straight and square and any sort of distortion in any way, shape or form really bothers me and you know, I sort of get a bit irked by it. So that's not my field of expertise or what I do. So you should always buy equipment that suits what you actually are doing 99% of the time. I would use a 14 to 24, maybe at the most 5% of my shooting and video work. And to me, that's a waste of time purchasing it. So I have enough that does what I need and I'm very comfortable with them. Now the uh, you might say, well, you know, it's a bit funny you bought a 24 to 70 because after all, don't you have all these prime lenses that cover that range? Yeah, I do. Of course, I've got the 20 here. I have a 35. I have a 50, but of course I'm shooting on that right now, so I can't illustrate that. Then I have an 85 prime. So yes, I have 20 to 85 in primes. Do I really need this? No, I don't need it as far as the uh, focal lengths go, but what I needed it for was a versatility. To be able to pack, for example, just this on the camera and take it with me anywhere I go, and now I've got pretty much everything covered. If I had to do some portrait work at 70, at 2.8, that's not too bad. Is it perfect? No, but it's doable. You can get away with that. If I want to do some landscape work, I can do that at 24 mil. It's wide enough for that. It's not ultra wide, but it's wide enough. And I also find that for video, it's quite capable and, and flexible. So if I want to be, I've got two cameras, right? Two Nikon Zs. And if I want to be filming like a backup mode where I've got one uh, at 50 mil, I can use this to make the second one at 50 mil and they're compatible. And I've got like backup because they're both filming at the same time, side by side. I actually have a special rig for that, which I'll show you. Uh, also, if I want to have them side by side, but I want two different focal lengths, let's say, for example, I want a video with the 35mm, because uh, that's actually the framing that I need for that video take, but I want uh, 70 as a uh, crop in mode, and I can switch between the two then. I can have one camera right beside it in front of me in 70mm here with the zoom, and then I can have the 35 prime or 50 prime or 20 prime or whatever I want for framing. So it gives me all that flexibility and option without having to take multiple, multiple lenses just in case I want to do that sort of variety of, of filming and photo work. So options are great because the more options you've got, the more confident you are and the more chances you have of being versatile and creative in what you do. If you're stuck with just a 50 mil, then that's always what you're going to only be doing because that's all you've got. But if you've got different uh, lenses and different focal lengths and options of aperture, you can start to practice being more creative and you can practice being more creative at the same time because I could be shooting this one at f4 at 70 mil and I could be shooting the 50 mil at 1.8 and you've got those creative looks that are different simultaneously when you're filming. So that's sort of really handy. Can't take photos twice at the same time, you know, trying to hold it's not about photos, but it's about uh, certainly it's very good for the video element. So uh, anyway, do I still uh, use my 85mm prime for doing portrait work? Yes, I do. A beautiful lens for portraits. I highly recommend the 85 1.8. I say when the 85 1.2 comes out, perhaps I will consider it. But again, I've got so many lenses, I don't think I really need it. It would just be like a, uh, I had too much money to throw away at the time thing. Uh, I do prefer the 70 to 200, as I say, for getting the face all in focus. That's very nice. And also the flexibility of not uh, having to keep coming in and out to the subject. I can stay in one place and move back and forth with the zoom should I have to. Because sometimes you're confined. I'll be honest with you. Sometimes you're in a relatively confined space, a stairwell or something, or a small room you're taking photos. You just don't have the luxury of getting back. And you don't always want to have to walk right into someone's face either. So having that is a great option for the comfort of the other person. And that was particularly relevant in this COVID uh, scenario where I could actually be several, several metres away from someone taking photos and still get nice tight headshots. So that was uh, very convenient. 
So uh, what else would I like to talk to you about? I'll talk to you about some other thing that I think is really important to discuss. And that is, I've got some speed lights here. You'll see the flashes in the corner here. Uh, the reason I have them is I was going to illustrate to you when and uh, when I use these lights. And particularly relevant, not so much with this, because in this one here you're relatively close. So what you can do is you can uh, you know, use a soft speed light with a diffuser at some distance away, it's, it's fine. But uh, what I'm referring to now is if I'm doing, let's say I'm doing some portrait work. So here's my portrait lens, 85mm 1.2, and I want to take some photos. How am I going to do it if I'm doing prime work? I'll illustrate. So let me take this off the camera here. I'll just separate that one. I'll make this safe. Always put the little caps on because the last thing you want to do is damage your lens and poke something in there by mistake. So there we go, just quickly fit the 85 on. Now, here we have the 85 on, and I'm wanting to say do some portrait work. Well, you might notice here that I have this little sliding mechanism here. What is this all about, the handle? Well, that's my little small rig bracket for the bottom. It's very interesting because it has a little magnetic Allen key in it. If I can just get that off because I'm trying to look at you and pull this out all at the same time. Gee, I'm making this look 10 times harder than it is. I tend to do that a lot of my videos because you're never in a natural position when you're doing a video as if we, when you were taking photos. You're not standing up and looking over. You're sort of looking over when you're doing a video. So excuse the fact that I'm reaching and looking awkward. If I, tur if I tighten that little knob here with the Allen key that they provide, that little nut, well, I'm put it back here. It's magnetic so it doesn't fall out. That's handy and convenient. I have an extra handle. So now I've just got two handles and that just makes it really great to grip. So I can grip it with my left hand, I can grip it with my right, whatever I'm doing, or both simultaneously. And having that little small rig bracket, I find really uh, securing. I also like the fact that when you're holding the camera with the rig, uh, it gives you the ability to put your fingers right through that and you never ever let go of the camera. So here, you're just gripping it like that. It could slip out of your hand if you don't have a strap on or something like that. But here I find, because you can get a really good grip on that, you're never gonna let go of it. And I feel safer walking around with a camera with a lens on it. But uh, that's not what I was going to talk to you about. What I want to talk to you about is lighting. So here's some uh, options with lighting here. You can use this one here, which is basically a bounce dome. Put it on top of your camera. Well, you can have it on a light stand. Of course you can. You know, that's an option. But let's say you put it on here. You're taking photos. It can bounce around the room, you know, give a glow everywhere. A little bit forward, but mostly bouncing off the roof and walls. And that can give a nice soft uh, light to your subject without blasting them. Could you put it this way and take a photo? Yes, of course you can, and it will soften it a bit. I just recommend you turn it down to less than half, maybe even a quarter of its power, because you don't want to uh, you know, over-illuminate them and give them a fright. So that's one option, and I actually find that's a pretty good option. Now, the second option for uh, lighting and you know, is here we're using uh, a honeycomb grid. Now, honeycomb grids are excellent for directionizing the light. So how would I use this? I wouldn't have it on the camera. I would have this on a light stand, and I use it generally for backlighting. So this would be on a light stand, and would be behind the subject at quite a distance away, maybe three, three meters away behind the subject on a light stand, pointing towards them, and would give a lovely golden glow of light behind them in the photos, which I'll illustrate for you. Now, I have multiple of these, and I'll often use, say, gold on one side of them and blue or or uh, red on the other, and it gives some interesting color effects. But here's the trick though, and I wanna make this very important. Never have them so that the light is reflecting on their face. Some people do this for an artistic effect. I actually hate it. I think there should be like a white or cream light on the face, and uh, these color gels should always be behind someone, not actually, I don't wanna see colored light on someone's face. That's what I'm really saying. So make sure that it's behind them where possible, and it should be a, a silhouette glow around the body, especially the shoulders and the head hairline area. It looks really nice like that. You notice that uh, if you have a look inside there, and I think you can see there's a golden filter in this one. Of course, you know, there's a hundred colors, so you can get any color of the rainbow as a filter you want. And I encourage people to use that and experiment with it, have some fun with that because it does give some lovely results. Now the other uh, honeycomb filter is this one. This is quite interesting here. So this is a honeycomb filter on the camera, just uh, pops on and off your speed light and the point of this is a bit of distance here as well and then of course like you're punching light in a specific direction so if I'm using say this camera here and I'm using the teleconverter and the 200 mil so I've got a 400 mil focal length uh, long lens I can use this on the camera then 
And what that'll do for me, and believe it or not, it might sound odd, you think, well, you've got a 400 mil equivalent uh, focal length, what good's a uh, speed light going to do? Well, with this uh, honeycomb grid punching the light into a specific direction and having a light to maximum, it will give some decent fill light to your subject. So if you're doing wildlife photography, particularly things, for example, like a bird, a bird's in uh, the wilderness, and it's often in the trees, and therefore it's under shade, and it can be quite dark. So what you can do is you can punch a little bit of light onto that bird and it just fills out the shadows and you know, you'll see even a little catch light in the bird's eye or something and that's all quite pleasing. So anything that helps you get some light and makes the subject pop, you want to go with that. That's, a, that's the way to go. It's really good. So don't be afraid to use a speed light, say, with this honeycomb style of grid. It doesn't matter what brand. It's not important. I think this cost me $25 on eBay. So it's not about the build quality of it. It's just a little plastic bubble, but it does direct the light in the right direction and will make a big difference in uh, how bright and clean your subjects are because when they're in the shade and you're shooting with this equivalent of now f5.6 it's starting to darken down the image you also have to use a faster shutter speed because you've got to compensate with a long focal length so if you've got a 400 mil length of uh, focal length you need to be shutter speed should be at least 400 if not uh, double that maybe 800 so if you've got an 800th of a second shutter speed and you're darkening the image again you've got f5.6 it's darkening the image so unless you want to max out your ISO and probably get a beautifully grainy photo I recommend that you use some sort of speed light and grid and punch a bit of light on that subject now even if the subject uh, flutters away after a couple of shots they get spooked by it at least a couple of shots you got were really good in keepers after all, it's usually the first one or two photos you take that are the good ones. After that, the bird gets distracted and flies off anyway. So make those first two or three photos really count. So I'm encouraging you to use that uh, for use with your teleconverter and long zoom. And I think you'll be surprised how much that helps your images and how great they look when you punch some light on them, even if it is only equivalent to a soft fill in the end because it's going so far away. So please don't uh, misunderstand and think that, that I'm lost with that. I didn't notice. Yeah, I noticed that the light is going to be reduced because of the distance. But as I say, any light is better than no light. So anyway, I'm getting back to this portrait lens now. I get off uh, tangent a little bit, so I know these videos go too long. So I'm most likely going to break this one down to two videos. Uh, so obviously we're on part two now. So we're talking about uh, lights. I wanted to illustrate this one here, and this is a flash bender. Now a flash bender is a very simple... Uh, arrangement it's a bit of material backing with some reinforcement and a nice soft diffusing screen and what this is I've got it on a remote trigger arrangement so uh, there with the camera I will get the master and I'll put the master trigger onto the uh, camera very important you push it all the way forward no matter what brand you use push it away forward and make sure it's locked down they have different forms of locking it down now sometimes it's a little screw like this one is has a little screw mechanism you fasten down and it keeps it in position uh, sometimes they have a little clip that locks it, whatever it may be. But do lock it down. I'll tell you why. You might be interested to know. On top of the hot shoe of your camera, both the hot shoe of the camera and the actual speed lights and the uh, triggers, they have all these points and pins. If this is not perfectly aligned, so with your thing here, if this is not perfectly aligned when they're together, they won't work. And you'll be thinking, oh, my flash is faulty, or the batteries are flat, or uh, this thing's stupid and it doesn't work. And It's all because... You haven't pushed it all the way down and got them synchronized, those holes, and then you haven't locked it in position. See, what happens when you lock it in position? The little pin in the front here goes into the little hole here, and they lock in, and therefore it stops it sliding and moving. Because if those contacts, those little contact points, and if you can make them out there, they're quite tiny, but those little contact points, if they aren't perfectly aligned, it's not going to work. And you might be thinking you've got some faulty equipment. Really, it's just that you haven't had it all the way down and locked into position. Once it's locked, it'll always work. So that's just a little point I wanted to bring out. So I'll have this on here. How will I use this? Well, I'm gonna try and illustrate it, but of course there's never gonna be enough room. But uh, this is what I call one-handed photography. And this really works with portraits really well, especially when you can't have tripods. Sometimes having tripods and or um, light stands is illegal. They won't have it in that area. So what are you left with? Well, you want some lighting, you can do this. So what I do, and I'm just trying to frame it, I'm looking in the camera here, for illustration purposes, I will use the camera on and I can use my little thumb wheel here to get focus. So the thumb's on the focusing position, hands near the trigger, I'm holding it in one hand, and I can take my photos quite easily like this, no problem at all, it's quite steady. Remember, you've got image stabilization in these Nikon Z cameras, so you don't have to worry about being a blurry photo. As long as you're reasonably still, 
the uh, sensor stabilization will compensate for any slight movement on your part. What you've got to do is just focus on resting it into your head too, and that also helps with uh, steadying it. So you rest it in there, you get your photo. It's a prime lens, you don't have to worry about zooming. Prime lens, get your framing that you want, get your light out. Now I have it fully extended and tilt it. So what I'll do, I'll, build this, I'll have to bring it in in order to illustrate so you can actually see, but I'll have it, say, maybe angled. So it'll be angled slightly down and uh, yeah, be as out as far as I can possibly hold it. And I'll take that photo, imagining this is fully extended out and angled correctly. And you can see with one eye how you're angling this and where it's positioned. And then looking through here and you take your photo and this will trigger off the light. And you'll have a reasonably decent soft light on your portraits. So yes, yeah, reasonably soft light now on your portraits, which is absolutely awesome. Get them a soft light and it's flexible and useful. Now you see how you can hold this. It doesn't weigh much. If you think it weighs a lot because it's big, it doesn't. It's just a big plastic bubble at the end, really. So uh, yeah, that way you can get a nice soft light. You can direction it anywhere you want. And it's if it's as if you're like you've got an assistant with you, camera assistant holding your lighting. You're just that assistant. And it's a softer light. Softer anyway than something like this. So do these things work? Yeah, they work, but they're not as anywhere as voluminous as that was, and that gives a much broader, softer light. So there's just uh, some tips I hope uh, you find useful. I think I've mentioned this before, but I just wanted to go over just how useful that is, and believe it or not, I do use it quite a lot. Even though I have tons of light gear and I have big umbrellas and light stands, etc., uh, sometimes they're just not practical to bring around with you. It's just too hard and too awkward and too much to carry and bring. Whereas something like that, you can hold that in your, put that in your bag, uh, assemble it quickly and you can be on the go shooting portraits with good directional lighting on the face they look beautiful and you're sorted out and you didn't even need any help so it's just another option it's nice to have options that's a great option don't underestimate how useful that is it doesn't have to be a flash blender brand, brand that's just the brand that I've, I have and I use I have several of them I have two smaller ones and two of those very large ones and that can be very useful and versatile particularly good for things like weddings and functions when you're on the move constantly, you don't want to move around a light stand or tripod everywhere you go. How awkward and annoying is that? Plus, it's a massive trip hazard. So when you have to be on the move and go, that's an excellent option to have some lighting with you. I actually generally don't recommend uh, in any way having these uh, speed lights on the camera and directional. It's too harsh and, and too, you know, unattractive a light. Also, it's uh, very intimidating for the subject because they're having to look at the camera and then the camera's flashing that hard light in their face. It's a little bit cruel on the subject. So by having it at least off, they're not eyeballing the, the speed light, are they? So that's good. It's kind. So uh, one other thing I want to talk to you about is the batteries. Now, it's, it's great that they've got a new battery out and in the new Z7 Mark II, what happens there is you can actually charge the battery inside the camera. Now, what I mean, if you've got their 15C battery, which comes with the the Z7 Mark II, you can actually use this wall socket arrangement, plug it into the, sorry, go around the right way, makes more sense. You can plug it into the wall power, plug it into the USB mount there, and you can actually charge the battery. So you don't have to bring an extra charger with you. Plus also, this can power the camera. So if you're doing long sessions of video, you're doing a half an hour length and another half an hour and another half an hour and you're filming all day. You can film all day because you can mains power it. You never have to worry about the battery running out halfway through that take. So that's a great option to have permanent power into your camera when you need it. And that actually comes free when you get the camera. So it's not something you have to purchase extra. It came with it. What a great idea. Thank you, Nikon. Brilliant thinking to bring that along as a free option with the camera might add for $5,000, you'd want something for free. But uh, they did provide something, which was good. So uh, that's a very handy option. As far as the battery grip goes, that's another new thing came out. I probably won't get that. I can't see any application for me. Um, but, uh, you know, to each your own. You may have a case scenario for it. Certainly uh, with the powering option now, I don't really have a lot of need for a battery pack. But it's useful for those who do maybe exclusively portraits all day and on the go. I find it actually builds up the camera too big. It's actually quite enormous, that to battery grip. Uh, it's not about the weight, but it's just about how big it is. And then you've got to try and get it in your camera bag. I can't fit it in the camera bag. It becomes too high. So then what I've got to do is disconnect it. And then you've got to connect it and disconnect it. Oh, no, I can't see myself enjoying that at all. So this was a, a purchase that I'm very happy with. The 24 to 70 here, 2.8. Again, highly recommended. Plenty of uh, photo samples will come up and I'll uh, run you through those and illustrate just how awesome they are. 
So uh, what I would like to conclude with is to say thank you to all my new subscribers and viewers and I highly encourage anybody to ask questions, leave comments. Uh, if you've got some directions for me as well, you know, you say, well, Mark, why don't you do this or try that? I'm going to listen to you. Don't think that I'm some sort of super snob and think I know everything. We're always on a learning journey. If you've got something to point out to me that I've missed, please share it with me. I'd love to have those tips and help just as I try and give tips and help other people as well. So bring in that feedback. Feel free to comment. Uh, I'd love to hear from you. And anyway, thanks for viewing. I really appreciate your time. So I hope you enjoy the photo samples. Have a good evening.